Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to the May 2025 CTSS quiz. As usual, we have 10 excellent cases selected just for you. And without further ado, let's get started. The most likely diagnosis in this case, well, we look at the abdomen and we see a cystic lesion in the right lower quadrant. When you look at the coronal, it's really oval and tubular. Well, what do you think about? Well, it's not the terminal ileum. There's no dilated bowel. I don't see any local inflammation, but it's a tubular structure. So you got to be thinking that this must be the appendix. But when it's dilated to two centimeters, water density, thin wall, and no local inflammation, that's not going to be a simple appendicitis. You could think about a Meckles, but the location coming off the cecum here is best for an appendix. It's not Crohn's disease where there's wall thickening or areas of strictures or prominent vasorecta. When you see a markedly dilated appendix, you got to be thinking of appendix pathology and you got to think about a mucosal of the appendix. A very, very classic diagnosis. Patients sometimes have this incidentally, while other patients present with severe right lower quadrant pain simulating an appendicitis. And sometimes, of course, they occur together. The most likely diagnosis in this case, well, we're looking at the aortic root. We're looking at the aortic valve. There's thickening and dense calcification. When you look at the shape of the valve, we don't see a dissection present in the valve or the ascending aorta. There's not a sarcoma. You can get angiosarcomas typically of the right uh, ventricle. Endocarditis is more of a clinical diagnosis. We don't see really a thickened valve with polypoid lesions or thrombi off the valve. What we see is a thickened valve, lots of calcification, and the valve has an abnormal shape. This is the classic appearance of a bicuspid aortic valve with extensive calcification. The patient will need a TAVA procedure. The patient will need aortic valve replacement. Just a very nice example. Of course, you remember that bicuspid valves fail earlier and calcify earlier than classic tricuspid valves because of the turbulent flow. The most likely diagnosis in this case, when you look at the pelvis, particularly on the axial images, you see the seminal vesicles with a markedly dilated left seminal vesicle. The prostate itself on the coronals is not very large, but it's this cystic left lesion, which is the seminal vesicle. So based on location, this is not a prostate abscess or prostate cancer. Seminal vesicle cysts do occur, it's the right location, but then they're typically purely cystic. Here, the seminal vesicle is enlarged, it's inflamed, there's soft tissue thickening within it, and this is a beautiful example of a seminal vesicle abscess, which is a very unusual cause of pelvic pain. Really nice case. The most likely diagnosis in this case I see two findings. The first on these volume rendered images is beating of the right renal artery. And the second thing is beating of the SMA. There may also be subtle beating of the left renal artery. What's the vasculitis that gives you beating? That's fibromuscular dysplasia. Often involves multiple vessels, including the carotid arteries and renal arteries are the two most common vessels. Takayashu's is large vessel disease, typically left subclavian. Kawasaki's, we think about the coronary arteries. IG4 can be multiple vessels involved, but usually it's vessel thickening, not this beating appearance. The most likely diagnosis for this is FMD or fibromuscular dysplasia. The least likely diagnosis in this case, well, what do we see? We see a large hepatic mass which has bled. There are some irregular vessels present. If you ask me what the most likely diagnosis, the two lesions that bleed the most commonly are hepatic adenoma and hepatoma. Hepatic adenomas can uh, progress over time to become hepatomas. If I looked at this alone, I would say mass with 
neovascularity and bleed, I would have said a hepatoma. And in fact, this is a hepatoma. You could have considered a hepatic adenoma. Cholangiocarcinoma is a possibility, but the least likely would be a hemangioma. Hemangiomas can bleed, but typically with hemangiomas, there's prominent peripheral puddling, and this has none of that vascular type appearance. So hemangioma is the least likely diagnosis. This to me is a malignant tumor. The most likely diagnosis in this case is what do I see? Very bright adrenal glands. If you show me very bright adrenal glands, the first thing I think about is shock. It's one of the findings in hypoperfusion syndrome. I then look and see the IVC is very flat. I also look at this patchy enhancement of the kidneys, but a lack of definition of the cortical medullary interface. Again, a finding commonly associated with hypoperfusion syndrome. And so when you ask me the case, okay, this is not just early injection. You can see prominent enhancement early, but not in this type of appearance. This is not adrenal hemorrhage. It's very bright adrenals. Renal failure, if you only saw the kidneys like this and it was a non-contrast study, that would be a possibility. But when you see the adrenals and you see the kidneys in this configuration, it's hypotension. The most likely diagnosis is shock. And again, this may be one of the earliest signs of the hypoperfusion syndrome. The most likely diagnosis in this case, what you notice is a mass by the right hilum. And you look, uh, the timing of this injection, we see contrast in the pulmonary artery, a little bit of contrast in the patient's left atrium. What is this mass? Well, it looks like it's enhancing a bit. It's very round. You could consider this as a lung cancer or lung mass, perhaps, even metastasis. Poor cardiac function is a thought, but if you knew the timing that this was a 23-second injection, you would know that it's not a timing issue in terms of being poor cardiac function as much as a very early acquisition. And the mass that we see by the right hilum is a large pulmonary artery aneurysm. Again, timing of contrast delivery and data acquisition is always critical. You want to be very careful. Sometimes we adjust the timing to modify for a PE study or an aortic dissection. But again, know that there are some things that can fool you. And this lesion here, if you waited another 20 seconds, would be very bright as it's a pulmonary artery aneurysm. The most likely diagnosis in this case, this is a very easy case. There's a dilated aortic root with a dissection in the ascending aorta, tracking through the arch and into the descending thoracic aorta and into the upper abdominal aorta. This is not the appearance of an intramural hematoma. And no, there's nothing about this to suggest vasculitis. It's not a type B dissection which begins past the left subclavian artery. This is a classic type A dissection beginning above the valve leaflets and above the coronary arteries. A very nice type A dissection. The most likely diagnosis in this case is when you look at the axial and then the coronal views, you see a cystic lesion abutting the adrenal gland abutting the spleen and above the kidney. You could think about a adrenal cyst, that's a possibility, but I think I do see the adrenal pretty well, that makes it unlikely. An omental cyst, not a great location, but mesenteric cysts and omental cysts can occur and push in different locations. You could think about a renal cyst, but the way this is pushing down on the kidney, it's not coming off the kidney, it simply abuts the kidney. The best diagnosis is a duplication cyst. That's what this was. Duplication cysts abut the diaphragm commonly. You can see them small or larger. And again, they're benign lesions, but can be confused with other pathologies. The differential diagnosis in this case includes, well, it's a very large anterior mediastinal mass. It's solid, not very vascular, but there's some areas of vascularity. Could easily be lymphoma. 
Could be a teratoma, though usually we like to see fat or calcifications, but sometimes teratomas are relatively symmetric in terms of soft tissue density. We've seen several cases of a typical carcinoid tumor with a very large, and they're really thymic carcinoids. They may be cystic, but can be soft tissue density diffusely. So all of these are in the differential diagnosis. So the correct answer is D. And this was an atypical carcinoid tumor, an unusual diagnosis, but one of the things you need to think about. So with that, We've looked at 10 cases, some really interesting cases, some classics, and some non-classics. And with that, I hope you have a great day and a great month. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.